to my Aggie Nation podcast. We're back with the same team as last week. We've got the great Alex Miller of the Eagle here uh, joining alongside. Zach Taylor is off gallivanting through the wild blue, blue yonder, so he's not with us today. But that's okay because Alex is uh, just relishing his promotion to assistant coach from uh, quality control analyst, as he normally is in this operation. Alex, what's going on? Not a lot, Travis. It's a uh, Friday afternoon. It's uh, it's been a long week. We've had a lot of different things going on here in Bryan College Station, but here we are talking a little A and M sports, and it seems like we've got plenty to talk about today. It it is nice to be talking about sports. Yesterday, I got called over, uh, pulled over to do a little breaking crime news as there was a police standoff, and let me tell you, I'm happy to be talking about some sports ball. Uh, I'm I'm with you. Uh, I I was uh, on the phone with the Milam County Sheriff earlier this week. There was a big train wreck in Cameron. And, yeah, that uh, made some like national explosion. news. Yeah. So fortunately, in both incidents that we covered this week, nobody was injured, and uh, so that that is good news. But uh, news duties aside, let's let's get into the sports discussion. Sure. Well, we? I I think the biggest thing that we have going on here in Aggieland has to be the A&M women's basketball team. Now, a- Alex is kind of our jack-of-all-trades. He he kind of fills in, does a lot of the digital stuff, knows what the goings-ons. I will admit to the fact that with my duties with the men's basketball team that I, I haven't been able to hone in a lot with this women's basketball team other than it is really surprising that they've been able to have the success they've had a year removed from Kennedy Carter, which is one of the best individual players this team has had. But I think that says something to the amount of, of team play, all-around team play they've been able to produce out of uh, this, this year's team. Yeah, absolutely, Travis. I mean, the, the women's basketball team beat Alabama last night on the road, setting up the big game on Sunday afternoon against some number five South Carolina. Anum's going to be playing for their first SEC regular season title in program history. They're also going for their first regular season championship since they won the Big 12 in the 06-07 season. And yeah, I mean, you said it. Uh, I, I, I don't know how many people would have expected the Aggies to make this run this season, given the departure of Kennedy Carter, you know, you, you, you look at them coming into the year and you see that they return a lot of, they returned a lot of good pieces between India Jones, Kayla Wells, Sierra Johnson, uh, Aaliyah Wilson was coming back and they got some, they got some big grad transfers too, or some transfers in general with, you know, Alexis Morris and destiny Pitts. Um, but yeah, I don't think anyone expected this and it, it's honestly shaping up to be, one of Gary Blair's best teams at his time at A&M. And, you know, if they win on Sunday, they almost lock down a number one seed, which would be the first time in program history, I believe, that A&M would be a number one seed in the NCAA tournament. You know, when they won the national title in 2011, they were a number two seed, and they had to beat three number ones in a row, uh, Baylor and Stanford and Notre Dame. But... At, at, at the rate they're going at right now, they they could be one of the four top teams. They're number three in the nation. You know, their their net is kind of interesting. I think it's still at 13, but their RPI is pretty high. It's in the top three for sure. Um, but, yeah, it, it's a big, big game Sunday at Reed Arena. Um, and, and this is a really good team. They, they play really good team basketball. You know, uh, and Dia Jones, she's – averaging a double double a game they have a pretty deep bench with destiny pitts and alexis morris coming off uh, and giving them some really quality minutes zay green in there too uh sierra johnson she's she's been really good um you know they've got four scorers averaging double figures a game and so yeah this is a very deep and complete a and m team and uh this is this will be a big this will be a big challenge for them this weekend they've 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 won a lot of ranked games but this season but South Carolina is definitely probably going to be the best team they've played so far this year sure sure well 
the big game, like you said, this weekend, they'll give a lot more clarity to what the bracket fate is for the Aggies moving on. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep a close eye on that one this weekend. And, of course, Robert Cessna will have some great coverage of the game on the Eagle.com and in your Eagle newspaper um, after that one. And, and, like I said, we'll, we'll know a little bit better what the postseason future holds for the Aggies after that game. We'll talk a little bit more about it next week on the podcast. Uh, Alex, though, I want to move on to the fact that it was looking like the last time we talked that the men's basketball team just might not play another regular season game this season, let alone maybe even another game this season. And little do we find out that um, they will. They added one of the games that got postponed back on. The Arkansas game is on for March 6th. So as it stands now, if I am not mistaken, that leaves the opportunity for two regular season games leading up to the March 10th SEC tournament. Um, that would be a March 3rd bout, home bout with Mississippi State, and then that Arkansas game getting added, of course, March 6th. What, 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 what can we expect from this team? Because you look at, at some of these teams who have gone on a week-and-a-half pause, and they've come back looking pretty decently rusty I mean this is a month and this is a month where they haven't even been able to practice a cohesive unit I'm Buzz Williams frequently talked about the fact that uh for the the Arkansas game February 20th that got canceled um they were prepared to play with a limited roster which consisted of like seven scholarship players um and some walk-ons but had that one more postponement, so they uh, they, they ended up having to, to uh, one more, excuse me, one more uh, COVID positives, so they ended up having to postpone it. I, I, I don't know quite what to expect from this A&M team, other than the fact that it's good that they're going to get to be able to come back for the seniors and have a senior night. Yeah, I mean, you put in all the work, especially through all the COVID stuff, I mean, who wouldn't want to have the chance to play, um, especially one more time at home? You know, it's crazy to think that it's been a month. It literally exactly a month, January 26th. Today's February 26th. January 26th was the last time AM and played at Reed Arena. Uh, they played LSU. Uh, they were competitive, obviously didn't score in those last eight minutes and kind of let the game get away from them. But yeah, I mean, I don't really know if you can kind of put a finger on what to expect from this A&M team. You know, before the big pause, um, you know, they rotated a lot of guys. Uh, they used a lot of different guys, and that's just kind of how Buzz rolls, those those big line shifts. Um, so I don't know if the, you know, lack of being able to practice as a cohesive unit necessarily would bother this team considering how much they substitute and how much guys play with different personnel on the court but yeah I mean it's totally got to throw off their mojo to you know only be able to practice with five or six dudes compared to the entire team I really don't know Travis what to expect you know they're going to play Mississippi State kind of a middle of the pack team they're 13 and 11 overall um, you know, I don't necessarily know exactly what their NCAA tournament hopes look like. I'm, I'm guessing they're on the outside looking in at 13 and 11, but you know, some, sometimes teams can make that late push here late in the season and make a run in the conference tournament. So Mississippi state might think they've got a little life left in, in their postseason hopes. So, you know, it's, it's not going to be a game where, a and M's going to be able to just go in and roll and play a team that, you know, maybe they're checked out. Um, but yeah, I mean, buzz has made it clear that when, when the time comes, they're going to play again. Um, I'm curious to see what happens with the sec tournament, you know, statistically a and M's like 12th in the standings based on the win percentage, but they've played the fewest games. So surely A&M would be the number 14 seed in, in the conference tournament. Um, but yeah, I mean, you close, you close with Mississippi State and uh, a road game against Arkansas, who's second in the conference right now. You know, they're, 
they're playing really good basketball. Um, so it's it's not an easy finish necessarily either. Yeah, Mississippi State uh, after AM AM did beat them earlier this year. Other than they, they did have a pretty impressive win to Florida right after that A&M game, but then kind of became the punching bag of the conference a little bit there, losing to Ole Miss, Alabama, Tennessee, not not terrible teams. Uh, Arkansas kind of had a little losing stretch there. It's a team that A&M has beaten before and, and can beat, but they were they beat them when they were on a little bit of a consistent roll, um, or at least a consistent role of having practice. Now, you bring up a good point with that game against Arkansas, and I do have to take a little uh, moment of a side here to uh, directly address the uh, uh, Arkansas fans who've been in my mentions all week. Um, <laughs> here's, how, here's, how, here's how viruses and diseases work, especially COVID. If you have a basketball team that did not have any positives through the summer, through the fall, through the spring, until now, with how science has told us this virus and this disease works, if you if you get it once, you're probably not going to get it again, at least for an elongated time period. So, if no one got it in the summer, in the fall, in the spring, and now everyone that they're, they've, they've starting to pass it around... Yes, it's going to take longer to, than the teams who half the team got it in the summer, and there's only about three or four people who haven't gotten it, and they got it. If the whole team is 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 viable candidates for the virus, it's going to take longer. That's just science, and people don't necessarily want to address the fact that if you've done a really good job with keeping the virus at bay up until this point and then it kind of infiltrates the securities, it's going to be pretty catastrophic because you didn't have those people who had already had it and kind of were by the wayside as far as making this a, a serious, longer-lasting issue. So they, they were almost doomed by their success in staving off the, the, the virus up until this point, and that's why. Because, like... At this point, why? What? What would matter in dodging games? It you, Buzz isn't gonna. He's not on the hot seat. He, he every knows it's a rebuilding year. You probably want the games to get a little bit more experience. I don't know. It just that that's that's how like science works. So you know, be uh, be cognizant of that. Yes, I, I'm I'm with you. Thank you, Doctor Brown. <laughs> Anytime. So, Alex, I was at baseball this past uh, week, whole, pretty much the whole week. That that was an interesting experience. Did you get to watch any of the games? Yeah, i i did I did get to watch some of the games. Um, I watched I watched the first half of the opening day, and then I watched the end of the game uh, when Xavier kind of made their run there in the second half of the later innings, I should say, of that first game. Um, I watched some of the Sunday game. I watched the end of the Wednesday game against Tarleton State. Um, not not necessarily the most ideal start if you're the Aggie baseball team. No, in fact, it's kind of a historically bad start. It was the first time they lost the t- first two games of the season since, I believe, 1996. And I want to say it was the first time they went 1-3 uh, in... in uh, to start a season since was it 2003 i have it in in, in check the eagle.com because it's in my story in there um yeah it's it's kind of historically bad i mean they were 19 and 1 since the year 2000 in season openers um of course they had that double header on saturday the weather kind of um made possible um the winter weather of last week and uh, dropped that opening game against Xavier Xavier's not a terrible team they i mean their pitchers executed well in that game they hit their spots um they 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 are a team that's going to win some games the uh excuse me the tuesday game abilene christian it's a team that beat tarleton state the team that a&m played on wednesday um and beat them pretty handily uh for their level they're probably going to win some games but it's definitely a a guarantee game that a&m should have had and and really the problem lies in two 
distinct locations. One is pitching, um, consistent pitching, not giving, not hitting batters, not walking batters, and, and keeping pitches low. There's a lot of um, hung breaking balls and, and fastballs too high that uh, players were able to batters were able to just jump all over. Um, but to go along with the um, hit batters and the walks, just just errors, just all around errors. It's kind of the baseball version of like turnovers in basketball where if you're walking batters if you are hitting batters if you're throwing wild pitches to let batters move into position um i want to say it was the abilene christian game that all six of abilene christian's runs were aided by either a walk a hit batter a wild pitch a pass ball or an error um there there wasn't Every single one of them had one of those issues attached to it, whether it was the actual reason they crossed the plate or it moved them into a position. Uh, I believe there was one wild pitch that moved a batter into to third with two outs, and ultimately he got drove in uh, on a single uh, later in that um, later later in that inning. So uh, they're a team that 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 the the, the offense has been good enough um, because I mean if you score six runs in a game that that should be enough to win a ball game especially with how highly touted Rob Childress's pitching staffs usually are but they're they're just not getting that consistent quality pitching and they're they're shooting themselves in the foot way too much um, to, to really be successful and this this weekend could either be a good turnaround point for them in that regard because they're playing some really um, good competition over there in Round Rock with Baylor, Oklahoma, and Auburn. Um, or it could be a, a pretty rude awakening to the fact that it, it might be a long season. Yeah, and you know, coming into this season, I feel like pitching we we knew was going to be a question mark for the team. You know, when you lose guys like Asa Lacey, and Christian Roa as your weekend starters, I mean, those are big shoes to fill, especially when, you know, a guy like Bryce Miller is transitioning from bullpen, kind of a closer dude, to all of a sudden you're wanting him to be the Friday starter. So, you know, not necessarily surprised that, you know, pitching has kind of been a question mark, but, you know, the airs, that that's definitely concerning. Um you know, whether whether that's just, you know, you had a week off before um, the start of the season or what, you know, that that that's that's definitely concerning uh, for sure. But, yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Travis. Um, this is a big weekend for A&M. You know, they, they play Baylor tonight. They got OU and they've got Auburn uh, in that non-conference game, which is, is a little odd. But, hey, it's. 2021 every everything's a little bit odd um, yeah a, a and, little bit of an explanation on that too um a&m originally had a series scheduled for this weekend before the schedule actually got released a team had to back out of it um and the aggies saw the opportunity to jump into this showcase um to, to make sure that they had some quality competition this weekend so that's another reason why they actually also backed out of the houston shriners classic which they were initially supposed to be in uh this year and they usually are in every other year um but they're doing this this i believe it's the first year they're doing this round rock classic um showcase so auburn was already a part of this field um typically you don't see conference uh, teams play each other in non-conference games which is pretty much across the board on all sports, um, but it won't count towards the conference uh, overall record because it is a non-conference game. So a little interesting, interesting one there. But Auburn, a team that just came off beating South Alabama, I believe, was it thirty-three to nothing? Yeah, uh, Auburn just absolutely obliterated them in the midweek game. I, I saw that score and I was thinking, wow. That's nuts. And then, you know, you, you kind of look at A&M and they're, they're struggling to put away Tarleton. So uh, in, in the in the midweek games, you know, uh, those midweek games, they can be sneaky. Uh, we've seen we've seen teams like LSU really struggle in those midweek games uh, historically. Um, so, you know, well, you, it, it, it's you know, baseball. Anything can happen on any given day. And there is a little bit of a reason why uh, it was actually Alabama a and I'm looking at the box score now. That's 33 runs on 27 hits, no errors. The score line, I mean, the, the, the scoring play, play-by-play 
takes up like a page and a half. Let's see. We have uh, Brady Moore or Brody Moore four for six in the game for Alabama or uh, excuse me Auburn. Uh, Case and Howell two for four. Got some really good uh, three for three. Garrett Farquhar. Uh, I mean some some pretty good uh, pretty good little lines here. That's gonna be a a team team to beat. But yeah, w there's a reason why midweek games don't necessarily factor a whole ton into um, kind of the NCAA selection. I mean they, they can, um, but it, it's the, an interesting dynamic that doesn't necessarily happen a lot in a lot of the other sports, and that is you have one team who's using this. I mean it's a guarantee game like in basketball, but in basketball you have a little bit less leeway to just completely throw out um, new lineups that, that you want to try and experiment and throw out pitchers who need innings. Um, you don't really see that in basketball maybe until the end of the game. In baseball, um, one of these midweek games, you, you might just start a guy at a position, give give one of your normal starters a rest, um, let a new guy, a young guy, have a go. Um, I mean, kind of, kind of perfect case in point was Taylor Smith catching uh, in the – uh, Wednesday game against Tarleton State uh, really struggled with his receiving. Uh, he had, I believe, one or two pass balls. Was a couple times where he um, looked like a pitch was coming for a strike and he dropped it. Didn't get by him, but um, the umpire probably didn't give the pitcher the, the 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 strike call that he deserved because he wasn't able to hold onto the ball. And just little things like that can um, change the complexion of a game because uh, baseball's so volatile like that. And so you do see some of these midweek um, matchups get a little bit interesting against good teams because, I mean, even as simple as uh, you, you throw a, a freshman or a pitcher out there who hasn't had a whole lot of starts and, and he uh, gets lit up a little bit, and then you're behind the eight ball um, trying to, to scrounge back. And not to mention, too, the thing that I've noticed a lot about you know some of these teams coming in here is Xavier was like this um, – uh, Tarleton State was like this the other night that, you know, A&M, when they're in these midweek games, because they play a lot of midweek games, I mean, everyone plays a lot of midweek games, so they play a lot of these teams that on paper should be wins, and uh, they normally win a lot of these games. They have a good record in these games at, at Bluebell Park. Um, you're at your home stadium. You have your own fans to bring the energy. They, 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 when they score runs, when they get hits, they kind of act like they've been there before. Um, when Xavier was scoring runs and when Tarleton State was scoring runs, they were, I mean, just spilling out of the dugout, hooting, hollering, screaming, excited. And I'm not saying that that's not the wrong thing to do by saying acting like you've been there before, but um, they certainly were bringing a lot of energy. And, and a &M started to kind of look more and more deflated as uh, these games ha have gone on. I think it, it was a big... Uh, momentum shifter and a good thing for them to get that walk-off hit win because of course they were pretty pumped about that but yeah these midwing games can be challenge more challenging than a lot of of instances in college sport because you don't necessarily get that same dynamic of um how much one player can impact a game if they're experimenting with a new lineup or, or letting a young guy get some playing time for sure. Well, I guess, Travis, here's my question to you now. You know, what, what's something you're kind of keeping an eye on for this a and baseball team as they kind of, you know, they're, they're playing in a they're playing in a big tournament, uh, kind of getting some early season kind of identity going here this weekend. Yeah, the thing that I'm really the most interested in, and I've kind of been the most interested in since game one. Um, when I saw the, the, the lineup card is you have, uh, a, there was a lot of talk and conversation about how experienced this A&M team was going to be returning. And, uh, because they have like three super seniors coming back because of the, the, the COVID rules and, um, a lot of guys with a lot of really good experience. And if you kind of look across the board, plenty of those guys who were the experienced guys who were the returners didn't necessarily get a whole ton of playing time. I mean, uh, Bryce Blom, who's been one of A&M's, been A&M's leadoff hitter for the last uh, three seasons, two and a half seasons, um, wasn't even on the lineup for the first two games. Um, Hunter Coleman, who's been a, a really strong utility player for this team, wasn't hasn't been in the lineup for a lot of these games. Ty Coleman has been a guy off the bench. Um, Hunter Coleman's little brother, a guy who started a lot of games. Um, 
those are the guys that that seemingly everyone thought they were going to be leaning on um, heading into this season, and and they've kind of been uh, put to the back burner. Now Bryce Blom has worked his way into the lineup with with a, a some pretty good hitting performances. He is uh, hitting three thirty three. He's three for nine with a home run. In fact, the first pitch he saw he got a start on Sunday. Um, against Xavier, uh, he missed. It was sat out the first two games of the doubleheader. Got a start on Sunday. First pitch he saw all season, he took out uh, out of the park to left field uh, on a, a, a high and inside fastball. Um, and so he's made a made a case for himself that he's he needs to be in the lineup, and he's pretty much been there ever since. But it's gonna be interesting to see how they use Hunter Coleman and Ty Coleman, and then from a pitching perspective, um, you know, guys like. Uh, Joseph Menifee, guys like Will Johnson. Will Johnson was going to be the next big thing out of the bullpen last year, and uh, he's only pitched, uh, let's see, three innings um, so far through this thing. When you have guys like, I mean, granted, uh, Nathan Detmer is a freshman that has come in really highly touted and is a guy that Rob Childress said was, is going to get some playing time. But um, I saw Will Johnston pitch during the bomber season this summer and actually thought he looked vastly improved his control was great he had a really wicked uh two seam fastball that broke back in on right-handed hitters um hands uh really great and but then the the good thing for them is they've had some other guys step up like mason ornalis who who had a strong season last year but now has he's pitched in uh six and two-thirds innings and uh has a point zero six zero era uh, or excuse me, that's a whip. He has a zero ERA because he hasn't allowed a run. Um, one walk, three hits. He's been nails. And then um, Alex Majors um, ha- ha- has seen three and uh, three and two thirds innings pitched, uh, allowed one run on two hits. He's been really solid as well. Um, also curious to see uh, what's gonna if if um, Bryce Miller AM's ace for this year can kind of bounce back from what was a pretty rough start. Um, from the season and, and kind of regain that that position as the ace or I, I don't know Jonathan Childress looked really good on on uh, Sunday and he's a guy that I've always thought could be that next in line to be the ace he still has plenty of time he's he's only a, a sophomore I believe uh, or actually I believe he's a still a red shirt freshman because he sat out his first year uh, after with after getting Tommy John surgery um, and could be a really strong picture for the Aggies moving forward. He, he might be a guy who, if Miller um, wavers a little bit more, might be fighting for that um, either Saturday or even, even Friday night job. Yeah. You know, kind of, kind of going back to the pit, stay on the pitching, I should say, you know, how, how big would it be for A&M to get a little bit of a longer start from a guy like Bryce Miller, Jonathan Childress, uh, you know, it looks like Dustin Sines went the longest last weekend and he only went five innings. I know, I know early in the season pitchers, they have a lower pitch count. Um, but you know, working into the game a little longer, how, how much would that help the Aggies? Oh, I mean, yeah, that's huge. And, and, usually that that'll come um pitchers are, are getting a little bit used to things getting their arms a little bit warm um and so you do see that a little bit um early in in seasons but you you see it with maybe one or two of the pitchers and you have some other guys who can kind of pick up the slack um so yes it's going to be huge because honestly what lost a few of these games this week was AM's bullpen. Um, just not necessarily been able to come in other than Ornalis and Majors being able to come in and really shut things down. I mean, prior to the season, um, Childress named Chandler Jaws, uh, Joe's walk, a, uh, the, the long reliever. And in his one appearance, he, he really, really struggled. I believe he actually has two appearances now. Um, no, he just has the, the no, yeah, he has, two, he two, has two. He has two appearances, five innings, but he's allowed uh, five runs on eight hits. Um, he, he was supposed to be, you know, Bryce Miller for a while had that um, workhorse role, that, that that one long reliever role that Childress always has that one guy in the bullpen who's ready to just eat innings at, at any given time. And, and uh, Joe's walk has just really struggled. So, uh, and then to look at that closer position because it was going to maybe be a job between Nathan Detmer and and Trevor Werner. Trevor Werner, of course, who plays infield as well. And Werner came in and gave up the two runs that um, uh, tied the game back up in the Tarleton game on Wednesday, and just didn't look like they had control. They just need guys, a couple of more pitchers who can be consistent in throwing strikes and and hitting their spots, keeping the ball low, um, because they just haven't haven't had that yet. And 
And if they don't have that, it's going to be a long season. For sure. Um, well, well, big weekend on the diamond for the Aggies. Yep, uh, softball has a uh, uh, weekend series with Tulsa, too, that they're seemingly rolling through, so lots going on. Alex, I think we're done here. I think we are. I think I think we've just talked all the sports ball we can. Um, so, thank you all for listening. We'll be back uh, soon with uh, a little bit more uh, traditional-sounding My Aggie Nation podcast, but we want to keep the Aggie fan up to date with what's going on here in Aggieland. So for Alex Miller, I'm Travis Brown. This is the My Aggie Nation podcast. We'll see you next week.